It was Marshal Nirenberg and his colleagues who broke the first few code words by identifying what fraction in an isolate from, from E. coli cells was actually the messenger RNA fraction. So they took E. coli cells and they burst them open, they lysed them. They got a lysate, and the first thing they did, which was very dramatic at the time, was to add 19 amino acids and the 20th one that was radioactive, along with ATP on the grounds that uh, making polypeptides would probably consume a great deal of chemical energy. And lo and behold, they produced radioactive polypeptides. This was called life in a test tube when it was first performed. It isn't quite that dramatic, but it was the first demonstration of an ability to synthesize proteins, polypeptides, in a test tube. You could then fractionate the E. coli cells into various components, as you know, by cell fractionation. So the first thing with E. coli is to separate at high speed in an ultracentrifuge what was called the microsomal pellet, that is the small bodies of the cell, from whatever was above in the supernatant, a clear cytoplasmic liquid called the cytosol. Then Nirenberg did several interesting things. To the microsomes, he applied an RNA extraction protocol which separated some RNA from the ribosomes but without disrupting the ribosomes. And then he spun them again in the centrifuge at very high speeds and got another pellet. This pellet turned out to be ribosomes but without some of the RNA. This RNA from the ribosomes shown here as fraction 2 uh, was not ribosomal RNA. So the structure of the ribosome was intact, but some kind of RNA had been taken off of it. The supernatant was also uh, extracted, specifically RNA was extracted from the cytosol to get, well, let's call it RNA from cytosol, fraction 3, and then an RNA-free cytosol. So these are the four fractions that Nirenberg ended up with. He then did a reconstitution experiment, something we've seen before. He found that if he took the ribosomes and the RNA that had been extracted from ribosomes, added them back together, and threw in 20 amino acids and ATP, the same sort of experiment he did in the first instance, he did not get any polypeptide synthesis. In fact, he tried various combinations, as you see here, and got no polypeptide synthesis until, in fact, he added back all four components. At that point, adding ATP as a source of free energy for this process of protein synthesis, along with the 20 precursor monomer amino acids, he did synthesize polypeptides, radioactive proteins, basically. So it turned out you couldn't leave out any fraction in this experiment. You may suspect, as Nirenberg did, that fraction 2, this RNA that could be extracted from ribosomes but that was not ribosomal RNA, might be messenger RNA. So Nirenberg did a very clever thing. He contracted with a fellow at Harvard to synthesize a monotonous message called poly-U, which is just a string of uridines, uracil plus uh, sugar plus phosphate, UMP, 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 which is essentially a, a fake messenger RNA, right? And he added that instead of the RNA that he suspected might be real E. coli message, that's fraction 2. So now he added back ribosomes, fraction 1. RNA from the cytosol, fraction 3, RNA free cytosol, fraction 4, and poly U. And one by one, in, this, in what amounts to 20 separate experiments, he threw in one of the amino acids and ATP. A polypeptide was indeed synthesized, but only when one amino acid was added, and that was phenylalanine. He made polyphenylalanine in this system, from which he concluded that the triplet code word UUU -U -U, must code for phenylalanine. Nirenberg and his colleagues uh, deciphered several other codons with the other polymononucleotides as well as polydinucleotides and even polytrinucleotides, but that became pretty tedious after a while, and Marshall Nirenberg hit upon a method to decipher all 64 codons in record time.